Well, good morning, everyone. Thank you for having me here today. I am completely terrified standing in front of a group of music educators and you're doing something with technology, two things I know nothing about. Um, and Keith's exactly right, I don't have a musical background at all. I was saying to one la lovely lady this morning, I could recognise a guitar and an old piano, don't know how to play them and don't know anything about music, but I do understand its value. Um, I would also like to pay my respects to the traditional owners of the land on which we're meeting today, the Bojak Noongar people, and pay my respects to their leaders past, present and emerging. Um, the story that I'd like to share with you today uh, ends up and we'll touching on, we'll, we will touch on uh, what we've done with music, of course that's why people are interested, um, but in fact what I'd like to do is share with you the story of Chalice, which is um, an amazing story of hope for children who reside in a community that is full of disadvantage. So they're naturally raised in homes that um, may resemble, may not resemble uh, a home that you are aware of or that you're familiar with. And this is really a story of what a group of very dedicated people have done and are doing every single day of the week in difficult circumstances to meet the needs of children. Because our hope at Chalice is that we create a story for the children that isn't um, indicative of their postcode. So for those of you who know Armadale, we tend to be on the front page or the inside cover of many uh, news reports for not great things happening. In actual fact, at our school, um, we believe we can break, break the stereotype of what's happening for these children and what's happening in, in Armadale more generally. And that starts with a, a, a way of thinking that may be the same as your uh, the way you view education, but for us at Chalice, we have a whatever it takes mentality. And we truly believe our reach and our influence extends well and truly be beyond the school gates. And so we think of the child in terms of um, holistically what they need within their family and holistically what their family needs. And we've set out to do things quite differently. And I'll explain why as we go along. Um, I'll just talk, although I'm the one who gets all of the acknowledgement, um, I have two colleagues here today, Simon Blanchard, who featured heavily in the document, documentary, and Jocelyn Campbell, who are both here to support me today and put their thumbs up at the back, give me, let me know whether I'm on the right track or not, uh, whether I'm making any sense. We do have a very um, large distributed leadership model at the school, with everybody running some particular area of focus, which is probably not dissimilar to the kind of... Um, the kind of leadership structure that you have at your school. Uh, so our postcode is 6112. I'm going to spend very little time talking about the difficulties because I much prefer to spend the majority of the talk on um, talking with you about what we've done to overcome those barriers for the children. So here are the difficulties. The children, many of them are raised in homes where there is a single parent. Um, the parents are young. They don't have an extended family network to draw on. They have limited understanding and capacity of how to parent. There are extreme mental health issues. There are extreme drug and um, alcohol addiction that either starts as a mental health issue and it's, uh, they self-medicate or the other way around. Um, there's a fair degree of crime. I've been there 16 years, not 13, but I've been there 16 years. I was pregnant with my son who turned 16 this year when I was first appointed to the school. Um, and even as, as recently as yesterday, a mum came in to say, Mrs Musumechi, can I please talk with you about the care arrangements for my children? I'm due to be sentenced on Wednesday of next week, um, and these are the care arrangements that I've put in place. Can you please make sure that, that they're fulfilled? So um, they're the realities for the children. What that looks like um, in terms of their everyday care um, is that there isn't enough money in homes to meet their basic needs, um, there isn't enough food to feed them, so they come to school very hungry. There isn't the money to necessarily pay for their... Uh, most of them are in school uniform. They're actually all well presented in school uniform. But there isn't always electricity to power a washing machine to wash the uniform. So the children will be in the same uniform, same clothes, day in, day out, quite often without wearing underwear. Uh, very few of them will have pyjamas. And I'm hoping, I'm only spending this time <clears throat> talking to you about this, not to upset you, but to help you to understand why um, expecting parents to pay for a musical instrument is never going to happen in our community. <laughs> and why it's so important that we do something differently as a school. 
So they're all the kinds of problems. What that means then in terms of brain architecture is that the children, um, uh, some of them were born addicted to methamphetamine when they're in utero. So by the time they are born, the damage um, with the neural pathways is already evident. And it didn't matter how fantastic the teaching was at the school when I first arrived, the children's brain architecture wasn't in a position to be able to absorb and make the connections as far as their language is concerned um, as a result of all of that great teaching. So my first couple of years that I was there, I was walking around thinking, why these kids aren't reading? Why can't they read? Why does our, in those days, Walna, now NAPLAN results look so poor? Why? You know, why, why, why aren't they just absorbing it? The teachers are teaching really well, the teachers are caring, they're doing wonderful things in classrooms, there's excursions and incursions and art and craft activities and they're explicitly, well, no, they weren't explicitly teaching, now they do explicitly teach. They had a lovely play-based philosophy as to how they, you know, how they would encourage the children to read and immerse them in language and yet our results never improved. We, I was leading a failing school. That's the harsh reality. Huge amounts of goodwill, brilliant teachers, loved the children, teachers, uh, children parents trusted the teachers, children t trusted the teachers. I was leading a failing school. So that's kind of the backdrop. Now I'll talk about all the good stuff, okay? Because there's lots of good stuff. Because this is a story of hope. The story is still being written, but it's a story of hope. Because what happens with the children, if, if I can just, oh, I'll, go back to the, I'll go back to the horrible stuff just for a moment. So if you can imagine, if you are experiencing all of those kinds of difficulties as a mum or a dad, but most of our single parents are mums, if you think about, you've got a mental health issue, I, didn't, I haven't talked about domestic violence, there is a fair amount of domestic violence that tends to go with um, in our community. So as a mum, I'm being harmed by my partner, I'm under threat, my partner might not live in my, my house, but he comes and he will you know, put a petrol bomb inside the car that explodes the car. Or he might, these are real examples, I need to just help you to understand the level of disadvantage the children come from. Or I might owe some money on drugs and so as payback a group might come through and open up the hose and come through a, a, a what are they called, a sky light, sky roof, sky, something that can be removed in your roof and put the hose down and then turn it on and flood the entire house. Um, there isn't enough money for food, um, I'm scared. Um, the teacher has said my child might need a referral to speech pathology, but there's no way I'm going to remember to do that when I'm moving from house to house. I'm fearful I can't feed my child. So what happens as well as um, an unstable childhood for the children that is deprived of language and deprived of rich nurturing kinds of experiences. It's not deprived of love. The, the, children, the parents love their, their children. They're doing the very, very best they can, but they're in difficult circumstances. So what happens for the kids is that they don't actually get what they need. It doesn't matter what we're talking about, whether it's food or therapy or time or whatever it might be, a, a play date, whatever it is, they don't actually get what they need. But they get stuff. Stuff gets bought for them. Usually, electronic stuff it keeps them quiet and it allows mum to go and you know, cope with whatever it is that she needs to cope with to get through the day. So what was happening when I first came to the school is that I would go in at the start of every year to play games for the children in kindergarten and what struck me most one year was when I went in and we were playing head, shoulders, knees and toes and 12 out of 20 children in the kindergarten class couldn't actually label their head, their shoulders, their knees or they, their toes. They didn't know what the body parts were called. Now I was pregnant at the time, I already had a two and a half year old. I knew full well as far as you know, watching what my daughter was able to do. You just talk to them and they absorb everything. You know, they're like little sponges. These children aren't talked to. And they're not talked to because mum's in such, or dad, in such chaos trying to take care of themselves and get their, their own life in order. You actually, your, your interaction with your child ends up being, do this, do this, don't do this, come here. How many times have I told you to do that? Get over there, don't upset your sister, pick up your toys. It's that kind of language exchange. It's not around that nurturing kind of conversational language that leads to really strong brain architecture and strong neural pathways, left and right hemispheres. So what that means is kids go into kindy, they don't have the oral language skills, teachers felt, felt like they were backfilling all the time, they would then roll into pre-primary if you can add in the complication of inconsistent attendance, if you can add in the complication of limited self-regulation, the kids have a, um, a, a not 
calm way of managing themselves, they can't problem solve, they'll just deck somebody if they've taken their toy, they don't use their language because they don't have their language, language hasn't been modelled for them. Calm ways of solving problems haven't been modelled for them. So what happens is I would, I initially started going to the year three teachers like all principals do, this years ago before I knew better, why are their NAPLAN results good? What's happened with their NAPLAN? Oh, you have to go and talk to the year two teachers. They're not doing their job properly, is what the year threes would say to me. I round up all the year two teachers. What's happening with the year three NAPLAN results? Why are we, why are they, they're, their reading comprehension's really low? Well, Lee, they can barely decode when they come to us. Go and talk to those year ones. You can see what happens. Year ones, you really need to be teaching the children how to read better. We need to work more on the letter-sound relationship. These kids can't read, and they can't read, they can't decode, they can't comprehend. They say, don't you talk to us. Go back to the pre-primaries and so on. So when I get to the kindies, the kindy teachers know everything. You get to the kindergarten teachers and they'd say, these children haven't been played with. Do something about helping parents to play with their kids. Why is that my job? I didn't realise that was my job. I thought we were all here as a school teaching kids to read and write. Anyway, so the more I dug around, did a million home visits, uh, tried to work out what was happening in our community, I understood that there wasn't enough happening in our community to, sort, to support parents. So I'll go on and talk to you um, a little bit in a moment about what we've done to resolve that. So just very briefly, this is our current leadership structure. I'll just change tack for a moment. Current leadership structure, me as the principal, there are three full-time deputies and a part-time deputy. They all have a particular phase of school. Every deputy principal has an impact coach who is responsible for working with that particular phase. So where'd pre-K go? Pre-K is being left off here. So there is one deputy and one impact coach that's in charge of pre-kindergarten, kindergarten, pre-primary year one, a deputy and an impact coach in charge of two, three, four, and a deputy and an impact coach in charge of um, five, six, and all of the specialist programs. And then we also have two full-time behaviour management coaches on top of that, so that teachers, the theory is, teachers shouldn't be interrupted from their teaching. If a child is, is dysregulated in a classroom, a behaviour coach will come in and support the child to make a good decision. And if they can't, they'll be removed from the class. Um, uh, they'll, help be, they'll help go through a restorative practice after they've regulated the child's behaviour with them, and then they return them to the classroom to continue learning. Um, I think we have about 127 staff and about uh, 950 children, plus a pre-kindergarten program, which I'll talk about now. So about nine years ago, I thought if I'm really going to make a difference to a school that's failing, I need to come up with some broad strategies that are going to take a long time to achieve. They're going to need to be well funded and I can't take my eye off the ball. We can bend and twist, but essentially these are the three strategies. First strategy, I think we needed to develop a comprehensive um, support service from pa for parents um, from the time they were born through until the time the children were three years of age. So that was the first thing I thought we needed to do. I understood a lot about brain development and I knew that those first three years are vitally important for children and if we're going to change the, the life trajectory of our children we need to start super early and kindergarten's not early enough. Um, so that was the first thing we did. The second thing, oh, well, we're still doing, the second thing that we had to do was make sure that we improved the quality of teaching in every classroom. So I wanted to go back and have a look at what the research says is the most important way or the most effective way to teach children to read. I expect that when I go to the doctor, if I have an illness, he or she will give me a treatment that the science says gives me the best possible chance of, of recovering. So I didn't feel as though we had the opportunity with our kids to waste a minute of our teaching. So we relied very heavy, heavily on what the research says around the most effective way to teach kids to read. And we, we um, at that point in time, narrowed our focus right down to making sure classroom teachers were, were specialists in literacy, numeracy and social skill development. And then the specialists could teach the, teach the specialist areas and we developed the distributed leadership model so that um, all of the leadership and then the understanding and the ways of working wasn't tied up just in the formal leadership group. We have about 16 leaders in school who all, fall, uh, all, all work with the, the deputy principals and they're all of our aspiring leaders that we work on developing their, um, their own leadership skills and they all go and lead a phase of school. Okay, I'll start with, do you remember I said all of the difficulties? Now I'm going to tell you the solutions. So it's a really simple stuff. If the kids are hungry, they're not going to learn. So really basic stuff, 
for 15 years ago was getting making sure a breakfast club was in school. Uh, we feed 150 children each week for their breakfast. Most will also make their own sandwich and, and gather their, uh, make their, their lunch at that particular time and many will ask the lovely volunteers if they'll make them some food ready for dinner. So the children will, you know, come with a plastic bag and they'll put a couple of pears and a banana or something in there. Not a banana, they go off too quickly. Maybe a pear and an apple, orange, something, and take some sandwiches and that will also be their food for dinner that night. It's actually um, a story of inspiration, but it's actually quite heartbreaking because I'm hoping you're understanding the level of disadvantage. So when people say, oh, the school is lucky, we were lucky in many ways and so we should be because the kid, this is not a level playing field for these children. They actually need a lot more in order to have any chance of being equal. And I'm not just talking about Aboriginal kids, but them as well. So Barbara and uh, Margaret are our two volunteers. They show up five days a week, rain, hail or shine. They're in from eight o'clock. They make, they're obviously making the Vegemite sandwiches for lunch, Vegemite and cheese or something. So the freezer is always stocked with um, millions of loaves of food. So at lunchtime, when somebody's forgotten their lunch, the a staff member will just go to the, the freezer and pull out, you know, whatever is needed for the day. Um, they, get, we get all of our food from food bank, which many of you might at your own schools. We bought a school car many years ago and that was to address the lack of attendance. So I'm um, a very compassionate person, but I do draw a line at some point in time. So if we've worked with parents on trying to break down the barriers as to why their children aren't at school, and we've put in strategies like we'll come and collect you in the morning, but we expect you, mum, to come and collect them in the afternoon to take them back home again. At some point in time, you know, there's a line drawn in the sand and we then make a referral to CPFS. But we do as much as we possibly can because the big stick doesn't actually have much whack to it. You can't really change people's behaviour by walloping them, I don't believe. I believe walking alongside them and understanding their journey, their pain, their difficulties is the only way that you can help support people to make a, a behaviour change. And so we do everything we possibly can, including picking them up, taking them to school, taking them to medical appointments. Um, you know, we don't literally pull kids out of bed, but we do. We're very insistent and persistent and we will knock on the door for a very long time to get mum and the child out of bed, into, out of their pyjamas, into their uniform and um, off to school. And if they don't get into their uniform at home, they're just brought in in their pyjamas, often into my office, where I will hurry up, do the right thing, you know. You know, being at school is the right thing for you. Um, in 2009, we opened what's now referred to as the Chalice Parenting and Early Learning Centre. It's a massive, it's a massive centre that co-locates and integrates all of the health and education and therapy services that um, mums, dads and bubs need. So we have a full-time child health nurse and the way the model works is like this. I have, I've just had a baby. I live within the Chalice boundary. The nurse who is located at Chalice will be informed from the hospital. The nurse will come out to my house for a visit within the first six weeks and she'll take with her one of our staff members. She's a family support worker. We've got extra fund, I found extra funding so I can employ two of them. So the family support worker and the nurse go out, well, introduce themselves to mum, make themselves known to mum, let mum know that they're there to support them, to support her with whatever she might need. They do all of whatever the nurse has to do in those first six weeks, all of the different checks they have to do. The next time mum comes in, which is around about the 10 week, 12 week um, stage, she comes to school. So she's already met the, one of the school staff members because she went on the visit. Then when she comes to school, she sees that same nurse and that same school staff member and she'll do her postnatal depression screen, they'll do the attachment stuff around breastfeeding and she'll then at that point in time be introduced to all of the other mums who've just had their babies in roughly that same period. So suddenly all these mums are beginning to connect with each other. They then are enrolled in our first mums and bubs groups and they uh, come once a week to learn what, to, what you do with your baby between six weeks and 12 weeks of age. They are discharged after that and they go into their next group, which is a parenting group, from 12 weeks through until, I can't remember the next stage of development. And by that stage, they've actually started to develop some really robust friendships, which is a key protective factor against mental health 
issues, connecting people, making f people feel like they have a sense of belonging and that they're, they're welcomed and that they're actually valued. And um, if you're not feeling well today, you might go along and pick up your friend and you come together. And if you make a phone call to the school and say, I don't think I can make it today, I'm not feeling good, I'm having a really rough day, the staff then will come out and collect you and say, it's okay, I'm there for you. I'll come with you, I'll support you. Um, and so what happens is these people develop a really wonderful friendship. In fact, we can't get them off the school premises after the class is finished. Every day of the week I'm saying, the next group has to start. And the family support worker is saying, I know, I know, but they love staying here and they're all playing and how can we stop them from talking and playing? So you can't. Would they just all talk and play and we open up a different classroom? So, um, so the idea is robust connections between adult and child to really develop that, that um, sense of attachment and we're trying to, ve to develop at the same time a strong sense of trust for the school staff because we want to be seen as um, a place that you can go for assistance and support, not for blame and judgment. And we're doing all of that because ultimately it's the right thing for the child. You know, if they've got a strong, strong network and a strong community around them, it's great for the child as we're trying to uh, sort of raise a village of people. Um, after they've done all of their mums and bubs classes, they you know, they might be 12 months of age by now, they, um, it goes straight into all of our developmental groups and we have three developmental groups that run throughout the, the week. A family support worker runs them. And so the first one is Move and Groove is what we call it. And we've um, ordered all this really neat gym equipment for little tiny bubs, little tiny um, monkey bar things to build up their gross motor skills. And there's mats and they tumble and they, they roll and they climb through and they go up and they go down and all the time it's around connection between parent and child and language development. They're moving, they're grooving, they're dancing, they're doing baby yoga, so they've got some downward dogs and they've got some all these different things, that these little nappy bottoms are in the air whenever I go down to that particular area. But it's a very much, again, a strong sense of community because don't forget these people have been connected since, they, since they were, the, the bubs were born. Now they might only be 12 to 18 months of age. The second developmental group is called Stay and Play and really that's just a classroom that's carefully and intentionally arranged around fine motor and um, socialisation type activities, lots of uh, craft activities, lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of language opportunities, huge amounts of modelling by the family support workers to the parents. Um, there's a nurse, there's a psychologist, there's a social worker, there's all kinds of people inside those groups. Once they reach three years of age, literally the day they turn three, we enrol them in our pre-kindergarten program. So these cuties down here are all part of our pre-kindergarten program. We currently have 85 children in the pre-kindergarten program. All of this is funded through the Mindaroo Foundation, which is Andrew Forrest Foundation. And he gives me around about uh, $300,000 a year to run all of these programs for the children. Um, so they've gone, they've been seen by the child health nurse from birth. They've connected with our staff and all of our services uh, right the way through until the time they're three. The children will have completed a three-year-old program, so that means they come to school twice a week. Um, the first 15 to 20 minutes of every session they do with their parents, so that again, there's a speech therapist and an occupational therapist inside that program trying to get into early intervention. You know, you only have that really small, narrow window of opportunity to make a difference to kids. So, um, yeah, so we, we bring the services to school. Uh, these people over here I think are rugby people. I'm not a rugby fan, so I don't know, but everybody, all the women were going mad, so they must be, they must be rugby people. <laughs> they were promoting something. Um, the Western Force people, and uh, our, one of our newest partnerships is that we have um, around about an $850,000 grant from the federal government. Um, that we have, uh, we work in partnership again with the Mindaroo Foundation and we provide an on-school um, parent employment service, getting more resources into the homes for families who um, have the capacity to work and hold down a job is super important because the more financial resources you have and the more modelling for our kids of parents who are waking up, showering, dressing, eating and going off to work on time each day, all of that modelling is incredibly important. Um, so by the time they get to four-year-old kindy, we've known them for three years. 
the majority of the children. All of their speech and OT stuff has been screened, the paediatrics have all been screened, they've got their diagnosis for a disability if that might be the problem. We understand who has a mental health issue, um, we understand what's going on in the family, family and we can generally support in, in one way or another. Usually some cases are super, super, super complex and I'm you know, left scratching my head and can't always support but we do the very best we can for the sake of the children. Um, I'll move on to just a range of things that we do now to meet all of the different needs of the children. So we have an Aboriginal Girls Academy that's funded through the Ricky Grace Foundation and that means that we, our Year 4, 5 and 6 girls um, have additional opportunities as far as um, their education is supported through tutoring. They, they work long and hard on understanding risk-taking behaviours, healthy lifestyles, aspirational thinking. We're really trying to get in early to influence and shape their thinking in terms of what they, their lives could be. So they just don't bowl along not thinking about much and just allowing life to happen to them. We're trying to help them to set goals understand what their potential is, understand what opportunities might be out there and then help them to meet those um, or, or to strive to reach those opportunities and capitalise on them. So we have about 25 children in the, um, the Aboriginal Girls Academy. It's the only one in a primary school in Australia, um, whereas there are lots in high schools. But I don't understand why... Well, I might say that. <laughs> I'm all about early intervention. There's a, really, there's a really clear pile of evidence that says if you don't intervene early, you're just remediating and putting band-aids on later. You're all nodding, so I won't go on. Um, to another way that I thought that we might be able to break or address the cycle of disadvantage um, and address the long wait lists for allied health services at the local hospital um, was to partner up with Curtin University because I couldn't work out where all these kids, all these fourth year kids, the students, Curtin students, would be doing their, their pracs. Like you have to do a prac somewhere. We've got a whole pile of children. You need to learn how to work with children. We need your services, so let's just make a partnership. So that's what we did. And um, we now have, um, thera we now have Curtin students across seven different disciplines. So there's speech, OT and physio clinical psychology, social work, dietetics and nursing, and they're on our school premises 40 weeks of the year. So that means that when a teacher needs to make a referral for let's say speech or OT or whatever it might be, we do make it to CDS, our, the, um, the Child Development Service at Armadale, knowing that you know there's a wait list there and a process we have to go through, but actually what we do at the same time, a dual referral goes into the Curtin students because they're, they're on our school premises all the time. So they would see around about 85 children daily for their therapy, and they'll work in all sorts of flexible ways. It just means it's another way that we can break down a barrier that inhibits uh, child development. So we've broken down the barrier. It's immediate, accessible, free, confidential um, therapy that our children receive. The mutual benefit is that these people are learning about you know, all sorts of things. They're learning about how to work with kids. They're learning about how to work across disciplines because speech OT and um, physio all has to work together instead of them all working in their own silos. I think if we can do more of that and stop working in silos, it's much better for children. So that's again another about an $800,000 partnership because the federal government gave us some money to build a, a purpose built space for them to do their work in. Um, mind you, they spend most of their time in classrooms and in our playground areas. Uh, and they have a full time supervisor who's at school coordinating and doing all of the quality assurance over all of their work. And then each one of them has their own discipline specific clinicians, who, clinical supervisors who come out to check on whether me as a speech uh, student is clinically doing all of the right treatments for a child who requires speech therapy. Um, everything we do in school is done explicitly, so, that, so that's right down to the way we teach behaviour. We're a PBS school, which means positive behaviour support school. Uh, we don't have a punitive approach to the way we manage the children's behaviour. We understand that most of it uh, manifests or um, sort of originates from a trauma background 
and they're not doing it because they're naughty. Uh, quite often they're doing whatever it is they're doing because they have not understood the importance of it and or have no understanding of the words we're saying. So I gave up many years ago saying, you know, you need to show your teacher respect. Your teacher's very upset because you didn't show her any respect. No concept of what respect is. No concept of that looking at somebody and giving eye contact and nodding when they're telling you something is kind of what we, that's kind of how we communicate. You know, you're nodding at me while I'm saying something to you. It gives the, the speaker some indication that you've understood and you're processing whatever it is that the, that the, the teacher is saying. So there was kind of none of those really basic um, understandings that so, are so important. Again, it goes back to that lack of language, the lack of communication, the lack of time spent. Uh, in, a, in a family unit. And so we have a behaviour matrix and we teach behaviour as explicitly as we teach any other curriculum area. So we don't leave anything to chance for the kids. We're trying to give them the best possible chance of being successful. And that, I won't play that, that was very, very embarrassing that some office staff put this to get these slides together for me. When I looked at them last night, just to have a quick preview, um, they've put in videos. Simon, do you remember these from years ago when we were teaching the children how to use the toilet properly? Can you believe the office staff put that in thinking that I would like to show you all how I teach the children to use the toilets properly? We do teach them how to use the, to the toilets proper properly. Every Monday, every Monday fortnight, the PBS team devises a new um, skit that the staff play out and I'm supposed to lead and read. And I, again, preview it on Sunday nights and go, oh my God, what have they got us doing tomorrow? Um, so we won't play those because they are highly embarrassing, but I will let you know that the, that the, the little chairs and all of those sorts of things there, we model, we get a group of teachers modeling the correct way of doing something. And then we have one person coming in to present or show the non-example. And the audience goes wild when the teacher does the wrong thing. This particular teacher down, or one of the teachers up there, Mrs. Plunkett, she's known throughout the school as being the naughty teacher because she will squirt the pump of soap everywhere, she leaves the taps running, she chews her apple in the toilet. We carry on with a great amount of drama and exaggeration and the children are aghast at Mrs. Plunkett's behaviour every second Monday morning when she comes out and does the wrong thing. Um, but the idea is we model explicitly what's expected, we talk to them, we show them, we reinforce them, we do it as a whole school. It's a painstakingly laborious process, but we're trying to make sure there's no gaps in their understanding. Because if I'm growling at you because you've left the taps on and you've put the soap all over the floor, but you actually had no concept that that's what you were supposed to do because that isn't what you do at home, then that isn't fair. So we're just trying to make sure there's no guesswork for children. We're really clear about what we expect. And there's actually no guesswork for the staff either. They're really clear about what's expected from them. Aren't you, Simon? <laughs> Uh, this is the RISE UP zone. RISE, uh, we've got a, a little acronym thing, it's not really an acronym, but it stands for Respect, Responsibility. We've borrowed the I from Responsibility, Safety and Excellence to make up RISE, um, which was also a nice, just fits in nicely with what we're trying to do with children, take them from where they are to where we want them to go. Um, this is the Rise Up Zone. The Rise Up Zone is an alternative space that we've created for the children who need to regulate because their behaviour is either um, unsafe to themselves or others when they go outside to play. When they go outside to play, they're continually hurting other people or during class time, uh, they need a space to, so they've, they've not followed the teacher's instructions for whatever reason, they've become very dysregulated, that could look like ag aggression and they need a space to go in and calm down. The space that you're seeing over on actually all of those spaces, there's two sides to this particular zone, the rise up zone. One side is when they have to come in, calm down and reflect, restore and then go back and do whatever it is that they, they were supposed to do in the first place. The other side, the fun zone, is where they get to go to develop all of their social skills. So if they're not okay to go out, not safe enough to be outside in the playground, some staff will take them in there at recess and at lunchtime and will facilitate play opportunities, but inside where we can structure uh, what's going on and really closely supervise and then when the kids feel and the staff feel that they're ready to go outside into the playground to play with other children with less structure and less supervision they can negotiate that. Some of the children uh, come into play just because they um, tend to be lonely 
and are isolated and don't feel like they have a friend. So not all of the children are, who are in here are, are in there because they're unsafe to themselves or others. Right, the part you're probably interested in. Now I've been babbling on for all of that time. Um, we were incredibly fortunate to be offered the opportunity to be involved in this documentary. Um, I'll talk to you about how it occurred, if, you, if that's interesting to you, and then you can ask any amount of questions, because I really haven't scripted any of this, I'm just talking. Um, so, I know nothing about music, I've already said that, I, I don't understand anything about it, it's like another language, when those two come into my office and there's either a problem or they're looking for advice, I say, you'll have to code switch for me, talk to me what it means if I was learning to read. I understand how to teach children to read, I do not understand anything about music, so Simon does his best to you know, code switch and pretend he's back to being a pre-primary teacher, which is where he was when I first um, employed him. So uh, we were approached by a film company, Artemis, um, who has a really strong re reputation uh, for, for creating and producing quality um, documentaries. Uh, we were approached, we were shortlisted, there were 15 other schools who were offered this opportunity. Um, the Director General um, made some recommendations as to who she would like to see offered the opportunity. The film company went and met with a variety of schools. I said, pick me. We aren't doing music overly well. Simon will let me say that. Won't you, Simon? Okay, so Simon is doing a brilliant job. He is full of energy. He absolutely um, was on a learning curve and he would be the first one to come and say to me, not quite sure, Lee, I'm doing my best here, but not quite sure what we're doing. I understand what, brain, uh, what music does for the brain. We're all about what the research says. That's what our whole school is founded on. Let's try and find ways to create an edge for these kids that creates hope, that builds on their brain architecture and gives them a better opportunity in life. Music was one of our missing links where I thought that maybe we could add some value to what we were already doing. Simon certainly needed some assistance. We needed some assistance in school. I believe in it, don't understand it, but I believe in it. I understand that it makes a difference and that's really all I need to understand. I don't need to know much more than that other than I'll, I'll um, you know, give the music teachers whatever, they, whatever they're wanting. And you, you won't quote me on that, Simon, when we go back to school. Because yeah. <laughs> I've just realised what I said. <laughs> um, so, over a series of about... Um, th this was a long time in the making because there's a lot. You can, if you can imagine all the bureaucracy and the, um, the risks that have to be checked by the education department to allow a film company into a school, filming everything we're saying over a series of months, um, all of the protocols, all of the privacy acts, all of the, you know, who owns the footage, whose intellectual property is it, uh, what happened, because part of this was, um, uh, part of the deal was that the film company would follow certain characters into their homes. Well, I've just described some of the backgrounds for you. So what would happen if the film company went into a home where an issue was occurring? When would they call out? Who, who had the right to say when it was time for them to stop and the cameras needed to move? There was all sorts of things that we had to negotiate and sort through first. All of that was done over a series of um, long time, Simon, 18 months maybe, yeah. Maybe 18 months to get all the legalities sorted and the logistics sorted and get the timing right. Don't interrupt that plan. Don't be here on the sports carnival day. Don't do this. You can't come now. Not now. It's testing time. It's this time. Anyway, in the end, just roll up your sleeves and get on with it. So as long as they understood that it was like a fly on the wall kind of a documentary, they could follow us around at any point until I said stop. We either have to lock the school down or we have to, you know, follow whatever process because things have become, you know, there's an incident that's occurred and we have to take control. As long as they understood what the line was that, and they were very respectful of that and we actually got along extremely well. So what that has resulted in is the most amazing opportunity on top of all of the other amazing things that happen at our school. This has been... Um, this has been something that makes me cry most times when I think about it and I already know how everything ends and it still makes me cry because it's something that actually deeply touches you. Um, I say again, know nothing about music but I understand how it makes me feel um, and I understand the, you know, the stuff that makes me want to jump around and dance and I understand the, the stuff that makes me want to cry and what I really loved watching was the impact that it had on these children and their families. And that was something that was incredibly special. So up there you'll see Mihal, 
uh, mucking around in the library, can't remember what he was doing on that particular day. Got James Morrison up there teaching the kids. He'd done some master workshops that um, across at the Salvation Army because they were our partners as far as Just Brass is concerned. Then you can see Guy who came out on several occasions. He's an amazing man, if I can just let you know that um, he his foundation provided us the year that the documentary um, had started. That was that 2017. 2017, he provided us with $4,000 worth of um, vouchers so that we could do something for our community. It happened to be Christmas time, and I know Christmas time is not a nice time for our children. They generally don't want to go on to school holidays, because if you can imagine, it's six weeks of not being able to come to school, and that's kind of the, the place where they feel very safe, because everything is very predictable for them, very, very structured, people love them. Um, and so Christmas isn't always a very nice time for our families either. There's a lot of guilt, there's a lot of financial pressure, as there is for everybody. It's magnified in a community where there aren't many uh, financial resources to begin with. So um, Guy's Foundation gave us $4,000 worth of vouchers. Rochelle and the lovely elves who were in the front office all went... Um, well, they got smarter the second year. The first year they went out with the vouchers to Coles or Woolworths or some place and came back with a school car, you know, load after load after load of groceries and they turned our boardroom into just, there were hampers everywhere you could imagine and then staff nominated, I think there were 80 families who we thought were quite destitute and would very much appreciate a hamper. That was the time I probably realised how difficult it is for our families. One lady came to the boardroom door when she'd been called to say, you know, we have a gift for you, would you like, you know, Merry Christmas sort of thing. She was absolutely sobbing, as were all of, as were Rochelle and all of the elves in the office. And um, she said, my children have never had ham. We've, we've only ever used the stuff, what's the stuff in the can called? Spam. Spam? Yeah, the, the stuff in the can. Um, we've, I've n never in my wildest dreams thought I'd be able to give my kids ham. And then somebody else would forgotten somebody's bag of potatoes and they got to their car and ran back and said that lady got a bag of potatoes got a bag of potatoes too so does that help you understand the need in the community hope so yeah so guys foundation um, enabled us to do that uh, last year he wrote again and said Lee do you want the same thing I said yes please so another four thousand dollars came our way the elves in the office were much smarter this time they shopped online they got everything delivered <laughs> the boardroom was still full of um, of hampers but the wonderful thing is they made sure that every um, for every family who was receiving the hamper they worked out uh, how many children are in that family our families are usually quite big um, how many children are in that family, what are their ages, and let's go and buy them a present age. So not only was there a hamper, but there was a present that was wrapped. That's a big deal for our kids, a wrapped present. That's super, super important. Um, many of the presents were books, because we push books, push reading, push language, push anything to do with language. Yeah, you can see the um, expression on Reese's face there is quite, quite chuffed being able to talk with James about whatever they were talking about. Some other clips up here. So on top of the Just Brass program, on top of, um, so that's the partnership between us and the Salvation Army. We have the wonderful opportunity to have the highly talented skills of Mihal McCarthy, who's the senior lecturer at WAPA, who mentors um, Simon and Jocelyn, and who's responsible for me employing Jocelyn. The school's too big for one music teacher. We have a double stream of every, every subject, so two of every specialist um, two teachers in every specialist area. We needed Simon to have a mate, and Jocelyn's his mate, and we needed somebody super high quality who could come in and support Jocelyn. So um, Mehal said, I know just the person. Um, Jocelyn had graduated as one of, well, I think Mehal was quite um, keen for me to say, his number one top student, that she was going to make an outstanding teacher, and he wanted us to have the opportunity to have that outstanding teacher, and we're very, very grateful for that. So these wonderful people have the, the support of me Hall. We have the support and the input of Guy and Anita Collins, which has been just amazing. This is the lovely Michelle. She's our Just Brass teacher. This is Rachel, fantastic, fantastic teacher who cries all the time because she's so touched by what happens with the children. She's always in my office saying, Lee, I've got to share this great story with you. She's always crying. Um, she does um, the... 
the violin and there's another lady, Stephanie, who teaches cello and Ziggy at the top there is this ultra cool guy who is puzzled as to why the children won't do as he's telling them to do. <laughs> he's really chill, like he's the opposite of explicit and he can't work out why they just... Uh, he just says, come on in guys, grab a seat. Well, you don't, that kind of doesn't work with our, our boys because they'll just take as much leeway as you can give them. Anyway, wonderful, wonderful, wonderful um, instrumental teachers. Now, I've promised Keith that this will work. So these are some scenes that um, you won't have seen on the documentary. I'm have most people seen the documentary? Yeah. I just thought you might like to see some of these scenes because this makes me cry all the time. This is just beautiful. You see our children totally focused. Chalice is just brass students and their wonderfully dedicated teacher, Michelle Wilde. What fascinates me, what blows me away is that seven months, I mean, who, who, who wasn't playing a brass instrument seven months ago? And you just come ahead so fast. Of course, it's fantastic to, I mean, seven months, you know, by then you'd want to be at the Perth Concert Hall, <laughs> wouldn't you? <laughs> sounds quite 
quite crude, and even I can I can see the difference. <laughs> I can see the difference. They're um, the brass children, the guitar children, the strings children, the choir. Jocelyn and uh, Simon led uh, the entire school yesterday, with the exception of 120 kindergarten children. They couldn't come. There's too many to fit in the undercovered area, but um, they led them in. Um, I'm Australian, thank you Simon for that one, yep, and it just was amazing, it just was amazing, even the little, uh, there's a few little beautiful pre-primary children at the front of the assembly and I was videoing them and when I was watching it last night there was one just mimicking you Jocelyn, just mimicking, she didn't say a word but she was mimicking you because you were doing this and she was doing this and her friend beside her was nudging her, you're not allowed to do that, you've got to have your hands down, and she's going, oh I'm doing this. <laughs> Didn't know the words, but yeah, very, very, very cute. But it just sounded beautiful and it brought the whole community together. The parents feel fantastic. Um, they think they're really special. They're very proud of their children and so they should be. Uh, and we're proud of all of them. We're certainly proud of our, our wonderful uh, Jocelyn and Simon at the back there. And so, um, look, everyone asked me about this. This isn't the reason we've put a music program in place. Of course I care about the children's academic results. Um, but what I care more about is that the process that they're going through as far as their education is concerned and the experiences that we're giving them. But in case you're a data-driven person, I'll talk to you about the, the uh, NAPLAN results. So if you have a look in 2014, these, these are our grammar and punctuation results. 2014, we've moved over here. To, oh, sorry. This is the low progress, low achievement gra grid. No one wants to be in this grid. You don't want your results in this lower left quadrant. Low progress, lower achievement. This is 2014, this is 2015, there's 2016, it's moving to the right area, higher progress but still low achievement, that's still not what we're wanting. Uh, 2017 is here, here's 2018. Higher progress, higher achievement, that's the quadrant every principal wants their results to be in because that's what gets shown on every bit of website and every that's what we're judged by. So we're all trying to get over there. If you have a look at our year five, um, so this is year five, uh, this is our, the progress three to five. This is three to five as well. This particular area is writing. Here again, low progress, lower achievement in 2014, 15, six, 16, 17, 18. So over there in that high progress, high achievement column, it doesn't look like that for every single curriculum area. We haven't made that much of a difference in every single curriculum area. I'm only showing you the good stuff. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we are mo making progress in every area, but this is the most marked. These are the two mo most marked areas. We've certainly moved from being a failing school into a school that's actually trying to chase chase down better than postcode results because you understand the research about the community or wherever the child is born that's going to be typically what that that's the biggest determinant of their academic performance well, we're trying to shape that um, stereotype and I think this is really important because this is a, a, a journey that we're all on together and the story is be, to be continued but it's certainly a story of hope and that's the story we're trying to trying to write and those two people at the back there are, are, are just two of the authors at our school because it's up to each and every one of us to do our bit to make a difference to kids, challenge our mindset and make sure they get what they deserve. Thank you.